Grab your hammers, friends. We are about to build a table with Miss Sierra. I am so excited for this interview. Sierra is just simply an amazing, unapologetic, transparent, open person. I am so excited to have crossed paths with her, and I will not prolong this introduction because the interview is lengthy, but it's good. It's some good stuff. Sierra, um, is coming to us from Virginia, first generation student, has did some nonprofit work, some work in higher education, um, left higher education and is now out here, quote unquote, figuring out what she wants to do when she grows up. I am I'm just elated. So without further ado, no long introduction. You can find out all the things uh, via the links in the show Hi, notes. Sierra. So here's Sierra. I want to start by just thanking you for taking time out of your schedule to be on my show. I am excited to hear from you and hear about your experiences and all things Sierra. So we're going to kick off with you telling us a little bit about yourself. Cool, cool. Thank you so much for having me as well. Um, Like you said, my name is Sierra. I am from Martinsville, Virginia. And if I can describe it, it is a place where we have uh, NASCAR racing, and that's it. So um, that just shows how small my town is um, that I'm from. I am a graduate of Rafa University as well as Longwood University um, with my bachelor's and master's, and I worked in student affairs for about seven to eight years, depending on how you're counting, and then I decided to literally up and quit, turn to my resignation, and was like, no, nah, I'm good, and biggity bounce, and so in that year, it's been, a, I think it's, yeah, year in, two, three months since I left the field, and so now I'm in the search of, uh, I guess, what Sierra really wants trying to figure out um, what, what I really want to do, what actually motivates me and things like that, and then entertaining the entrepreneur route. So, um, yeah, other than that, I think I'm fun, goofy, uh, chill. Um, <laughs> I call myself truthful yet tactful. Um, other people <laughs> might disagree. <Okay. laughs> but um am ready to... Um, in my head, I'll be throwing hands, but I really don't. The last time I probably was in like an <laughs> altercation was like high school, so I'm really not about their life, but I'm ready for it just in case. So, but yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> wow, that is so, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> hands, throwing hands in a while, but that don't mean I didn't throw hands in Look, my head. Right, <laughs> right. Muscle memory still there now. Don't try it. <laughs> Listen, that's so funny. So it's, it's really interesting, Sierra. Um, Worked at my alma mater, and I I knew about her or heard about her before I even got to meet her. This is so funny. Um, I was actually Uh-oh. in like two or three states over when I heard about Sierra. I was in South Florida doing my graduate program, and one of my mentees was like, "We got this new double that work at our school, and she bought that life." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, <laughs> that's what's up." But it was just so funny. Um. And then I finally got to meet her, so I'm I'm just like excited to to just know Sierra. So tell us a little bit um, about maybe your college experience, what it was like um, being a first generation student. What did you expect? Did it meet your expectations? Why did you major in what you majored in? Just give us a little bit of that um, of that narrative. Sure, sure. So um, funny story. I think I was just talking telling somebody the other day. Um, in high school, I was one of the top whatever students. I was class president, voted most likely to succeed, all of that. And then one day at church, my goddess, right, you know, I was hell smart. So one day um, my goddess counselor came up to us at church, you know, a small town, and she, like, talking to me and my mom, she was like, oh, so, you know, where has Sierra applied for college? And me and my mom just kind of just stood there. It was like, college. And she just, like, I could see this woman's face. It was a black woman as well. And her face just kind of dropped. She was like, she hasn't applied. And I think this was like second semester of my senior year. And my mom, I would never forget, she said, is she smart enough? You know? And wow. now my mom is my number one cheerleader, right? My mom has mm-hmm. always been super supportive. But when you are first generation, when you come from an area to where a lot of people don't, quote, unquote, get out, you know, we get stuck and a lot of people just kind of doing these, you get into drugs and, and all these other things and the whole dynamic of a low income area, right? Um right. she never thought that I could be one of those kids to go to school. So I never took offense to it, but I think it just speaks volumes of um why representation is important, 
why exposing your kids to different um, things after graduation is important. So anyway, so she was like, you need to send me on Monday ASAP. So I was like, all right, cool, whatever, lady. So I applied to three universities, Raff University, Norfolk State, and Virginia State. Got accepted to all three. And I think I just picked them because I literally had no reason. I didn't know the difference between an HBCU and a PWI. I didn't realize that I had applied to two HBCUs and one PWI. Um, but the only school that I toured was Radford. And the reason why I toured it <laughs> is because my very best friend, who people think that were biological sisters, because um, our names sound a lot, um, Thursday Harrison, she's married now, Thursday McCoy, she went to Virginia Tech. So I was like, well, let me go see Radford, because Radford is 20 minutes down the road. I got to Radford. I like the campus. They were smart. They paired me up with a black kid for the tour, you know. Like they were, they it was strategic. I didn't think about it till later. Yes, like, okay. marketing. <laughs> right, because I remember walking in and everybody kind of did this little quick look. But at the time, I wasn't. You know, we didn't know. We thought this was everybody friendly. So he made sure to like take me to all of like the spots, and then all the black kids were like smiling at me too. So I was like, okay, that's cool. So I was like, I like the university. I like the the program because um, I wanted to be a teacher at the time. I like the program, and then I also had my best friend, cousin, sister, friend right down the road. You know what I'm saying? So I still had okay. a safety net because I was, like, low-key scared to go to school, you know? Um, right. So I went to Radford. Yeah. Right. Went to Radford, and I think I had – I don't want to say I had a blast, but I had a really good – I had a really good experience. Um, I was involved, um, participating on these activities, um, of course, across Delta. I was in um I was one of the founders for the very first hip hop dance scene that's still there. Shout out to Are You Hype, shout out to Belinda. Um so I had all of these good experiences, but I don't think I realized how much of a token I was at the time. Um mm. I was right, right. Because I had um another sister cousin friend that went to Howard and she was just as involved, but some of the opportunities when we were sharing our experiences, she was kind of giving me that eyebrow raise, you know, she at HBCU. She like, um, why are they putting you in these positions? And I'm just like, I don't know, because I'm qualified. And and I was, but looking back on it, I was like, oh, y'all needed some numbers. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And I was that not so controversial black woman at the time. I'm definitely not the Sierra that I am now. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I won't check the edges. <laughs> Um, <laughs> right. So I enjoyed it. I was very involved, but it was just a lot of missed opportunities. Um, that hindsight is always twenty twenty. I I think Rafford was unique in that the black community created the experiences that the university should have already created for us. Or kind of, you know, we had a, a strong multicultural student services office. Um, with Monica Hunter, who was the director, Sora as well, who was also leading that. Um, we had a strong um, relationship with the black community at Virginia Tech. So I think I felt like I didn't miss out on stuff. Um, but I do think there was a, a certain level of nurturing that didn't occur. Um, like the the level for black excellence was really low. There's no way somebody should have been letting me go to class in pajamas and not say that to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Gotcha. Look at the that. And then still put you <laughs> still put you in positions though because yes. of the numbers. Right. And I was a mess. There ain't no way. I was a mess. I think it was a um it was one of the outfits one time that had pulled me to the side because I got the uh the orientation leader position which is real big because this is the first you know, the first person that people see when it comes to campus. And they had a ratio of twenty six students, twenty four had to be white, one had to be black and one had to be international. You know, because mm. um, there was a representation, right? There was a representation at the time of the campus, so I was the black kid, not knowing that there was a thing called the black kid. So this alpha put me to the side. He was like, you know, this is serious, right? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, no, 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 this is serious. And he broke it down to me what it meant. And I think that was like a slight wake-up call to like, oh, I need to take these positions a lot more serious because I'm not only representing myself, I'm representing a lot more people that I didn't even – think to think that I was representing um so yeah but anyway teaching major they let me do um 
one of those days where kids came in to play. I wanted to be a PE teacher because I was like, okay, I get to go to school and sweat pants. I play sports in high school. I can do this. Then let the kids come in and play, and I was like, nah, I'm good. They were all over the place. They were like little roaches. I was like, why y'all moving so quick? Why y'all going to touch everything? It was just a lot going on. And, I mean, they were sweet, but it was like, and then it was like snot. It was so, so much. So I was just like, okay, I need to change my major. So yeah, junior not. year, right, I was like, I got to get y'all up. So junior year, um, I stayed in the same area. I just changed from teaching, and I did the health education route. Um, finished up. And then came home to work for like a year and some change in nonprofit and then decided to go back for my master's. And that was another haphazard move. I just picked a school that was the last date for the application I hadn't missed. That's how I picked it. Um, that's terrible. I mean, the longer, longer is a good school, but I think if I had have been more intentional, I wouldn't have went. Um, the council okay. program. Do you was think nice. you wouldn't have went there or? You wouldn't have went there Listen, you wouldn't have went to graduate school at all. <laughs> I would have changed the whole degree because, okay. again, like, that, that's the challenge with being the first. Like, you are literally winging it. And there's mm. so many, like, decisions I made that were just like, uh, you know, let me just kind of, you know, see if this really is the nice and step on it. Um, so I think I, because I first tried to start the uh, master's program at ODU online for the public health, and um, I didn't do well with online classes, and I low-key was kind of intimidated, so I was like, nah, I ain't going to do that. And then I was like, well, I'm going to do counseling. And in my head, a bachelor's degree in health, a master's in counseling, I can do health counseling. That sounded smart. Not really thinking of the cost of the degree, like the literal financial cost of it. Not thinking of mm-hmm. the the my salary afterwards. You know, here I am just racking up debt and getting these degrees. My family proud because they don't know anything different, and now they think I'm a millionaire. And I'm like, huh? I have a master's degree, and currently, right now, I'll be very transparent. My base salary is twenty eight thousand dollars for the master's. Wow. Right, right. Sit on it. Sit on it, and then get a well, more. Like- Right. Mm-hmm. right. I can't move right now. I'm frozen. Okay. Right. Right. So I think that was, if I could say anything about like going to college and being first generation, one of the things I wish I would have known or done differently was known other fields I could have went into and um, known the salary. Like if somebody had a sat down and said, Sierra, with this particular degree, here's the typical salary. Here's how much it costs to live. Do you still want this degree? You know, I think a lot of stuff, like that typical saying of, um, you know, it's not about the money. And, and we were just having this mm-hmm. conversation earlier. Like, it's not about the money. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, well, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, people yeah, always say that yeah. when they got money. Like, it ain't about the money because right, you right. could, you know. Um, yeah. I, I right. think if somebody just had said to me, like, you can still be in a helping oh, – not necessarily helping field, quote unquote, but you can still help people and not be in counseling and social work and, and all these other fields that um, are unfortunately very underpaid because what we're saying to someone, we're paid, guilting yeah. people, right, we're, we're guilting people into taking these jobs and saying, well, if you love people, then you will take this low money because you love people. You know what I'm saying? And what, that's, a, that's a guilt factor right there. You know what I'm saying? You're, all, you're devaluing the work. You're devaluing the person. Um, and then turn around and making them feel bad for trying to live off a of paycheck. Wow. How dare you? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so all these things, just mm-hmm. being first generation, I just wish I had known more. I wish I had to ask more questions. I would. Have, I wish I would have known to ask questions. Um, I was just about to say, because you can't ask a question that you don't know is a question. Exactly, um, exactly. And, and then, from, yeah, oh. Yeah, being from a low-income area, I don't remember anybody coming in to necessarily talk about college. You know, we had that one counselor, and think of how many students it was. Like, I, she couldn't reach everybody. Um, and just being a counselor herself, how overworked and underpaid she probably was. So, Right, yeah. exactly. So she's just doing yeah. what, you know, bare minimum, and you can't – and now as, a, as, you know, good and adult, it's hard to blame her because it's like – you were uh-huh. underpaid, and your expectations were super high, and so 
Mm-hmm. How are you even supposed to serve, especially kids that like, un- this is a very unfortunate way to say it, but are kind of looked at as doomed from birth. And I think we kind of hit mm-hmm. that a little in our, in our conversation earlier, like, Certain kids is like, you know what, they was born from this family, this is what they got going on at home, this they're doomed. So I'm not even going to waste my energy on mm-hmm. that. Um mm-hmm. and even you mm-hmm. being like super smart, like most likely to succeed, but no one pulled you out to succeed. Exactly. And it's so crazy because right. um the the guy I talk to now, like we're from the same area and in the same high school and he always compliments me on like, man, you did this, you did that. And I was just like, but I'm really no different from you. And that's such a hard right. pill, pill to swallow. You know what I'm saying? When people walk around and, and it's not to say you shouldn't be proud of your, your accomplishments, but I'm looking around like, how did I, you know what I'm saying? Who chose me? How did this yeah. even happen? How did the stars just align? Right. Because th- it's, this area has so much potential, just like any other area, but how did it line up perfectly for me? You know what I'm saying? When this dude don't have degrees, they'll be dropping mad knowledge. And I'm sitting there like, hey, you know, right. I know people with all kinds <laughs> of letters before the name, after the name, and they, they're they not having this insight. So it's it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very interesting. And so I think, and, and this is a little off the grid, but it's, it's interesting when that's the whole it's not about the money thing. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas it kind of is. And – there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with money, and there's nothing wrong with work. I think coming from coming from impoverished areas, sometimes people think that there's like like wealthy people are bad, and like rich is mm-hmm. not good, and mm-hmm. like having money is not a thing. And if God wanted me to have it, He'd give it to me. Like, oh, mm-hmm. you got work for it, though, you know. And so I think that that whole because um, I'm from a very small area, also. Um, I get a little mad at my parents all the time because I feel like I was kind of sheltered because I didn't really understand like the levels of poverty that were like around me. Um mm-hmm. and so I I really enjoy like dialogue like this on and off a podcast simply because for many years, <laughs> probably about seventy five percent of my life, I was so ignorant to this. Um I'm not first generation and I just did not understand that like people didn't know. And so I would be the one to be like, well why didn't you just ask? Think mm-hmm. not even knowing, like, you can't ask what you don't know is a question. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's it's just so enlightening to hear um, just the stories of people who, you know, but still, you know, things don't, don't work out. It's exactly. I mean, as they should, God has a plan, but it's still so challenging. And I think that these challenges in higher ed get swept under the rug. Um, mm-hmm. And I say that to segue into this question of, in all of this, um, choosing, you know, graduate school um, because of the, the date, that, that was that was sissy, though. Like, look, I can get into this like, right, because right, right. I'm going to meet the time. You know, what made you decide, like, working in higher ed was quote, unquote, for you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um as I said, when I was doing, like, orientation in undergrad, I started to do um, being, like, a teacher assistant for the University 100 course. Uh, they created a, a new position for the undergrad, um, for the undergrad students for orientation, like, to work with the parents, like, being the orientation leader solely for them. Um, and I was one of the first ones that they chose. And so throughout the summer, I can't remember his first name. His last name was, like, Clayton or something. Um we were talking about something. He was like, you're really good at this. And I was like, okay, you know, I thought it was just a summer job. He was like, you know, you can, you could do this for real. Like this is a job. And once again, one of those dumb moments, I was like, you got a job, job. Like I just thought this is just a, a guy. He's just hanging out for the summer with a bunch of kids and we doing orientation. Um, but he kind of explained to me a little bit about it. He told me about his degree. Um, and that's when I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. But I didn't go into it right then. I, like I said, I worked for a nonprofit for a little while at home, and I am applied for my master's. And my motivation for that was when I came home from undergrad, I realized I was sitting around with people that didn't seem to have moved from doing something different than what they were four years ago when I left the first time, you know. Mm. Um, and I was just sitting in a space, right. And, it's you know, it's no shade to nobody, but I was sitting in a space, and I was just like, huh. Like, wait a minute, I can't, 
like I, I almost felt um like a shark in a pool a little bit and I was just like I'm, I'm suffocating I can't swim there's not enough water like I gotta I gotta move and that's when it popped in my head like oh there was this thing I did in undergrad that I really liked and I really enjoyed um and that's that's how I figured it was for me quote fingers <laughs> mostly because <laughs> um I have a serious fight or flight like reaction and all, oftentimes it's flight Anytime I've gotten into a situation where I felt stressed, mm -hmm, any move I made in life, I kind of looked at the trigger, and I always, like, flight every single time. Um, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. I struggle with in, um, being impulsive. <laughs> I'm diagnosable, definitely. Um, but that was the, the, the move. I just didn't want to sit around, have a degree, and end up getting caught into the same stuff, get into the same routine as everybody else. And I was like, oh, there was this thing I like. Let me go try that forever. And then I got into it. <laughs> <laughs> and then forever, well, it was like forever. eight years also, later. Also, you say forever, forever kind of changed somewhere about mm -hmm. six or seven years in the game. Somebody started thinking, um, I got to get out of here. And I am not going to give. I know a little of the insight, and I'm not going to get it to you. I'm not going to let Sierra give you all the goodies either because there's a way for you to get the goodies, and we'll talk about mm -hmm. that a little later. But right now, I just want you to hit on, you know, when was that moment? When did you just feel like, all right, this is it. I got to get up out of here. I'm over this. Um, and I think now you've been out of that um, industry for, what, like a year, maybe a year and a half mm -hmm. or so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what was there. like, okay, this – what was like, okay, this is it? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of the this is it moment. I think um, there was some stuff leading up to it. I, I think, you know, um, you, you kind of have all of those questions that pop in your head, like what would I do? Um, what am I good at? I was having a lot of confidence issues because I felt that I wasn't just a good worker. You know, like what field is going to have me at all? I've never even – tried to search for a job outside of nonprofit and higher education, you know. Even my nonprofit job, let's be real, one of the bros worked there and he was like, Oh, hear me a resume. I was like, Okay, cool. So I never really searched for jobs outside of higherjobs dot com. Um so all these things were coming into play of like just that anxiety building up. But the moment was when um a couple of things that happened and and I felt like I was getting in trouble for stuff at work that other people weren't I thought I was being treated differently. Um, I started speaking up for myself. I was being paid less than some of my colleagues, um, substantially less. And so I would bring it up. And then trusting in the process, the process never worked. So I would follow up. Trusting in the process never worked. Then I followed, followed up and was just like, oh, nobody ever even mentioned this. But then when I mentioned it, like, you do know they're white and I'm black and this don't look good. You know what I'm saying? It, and that's not how I said it, but it's essentially what I said. So then, then I was finally given uh, a quote unquote raise, which I say is what I should have been given in the first place. Um, but the moment that was like the it, where all these things were like hitting me at once, and I was just not coping well. I felt like a shell just coming to work. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't being effective. Um, I felt like it was pouring into my work and impacting my students, which is something I would never want to do. Um, and I mentioned to, uh, I mentioned, it's, it's in, it's in the book that we'll talk about later, but I mentioned that I had called the suicide hotline the night before and they didn't answer. Mm. And I kind of like chuckled because that's one of my defense mechanisms. And I was just like, yeah, so, you know, I came to work so I wouldn't kill myself. You know, I was like, huh, eh. <laughs> you know, and the person who I said it to literally didn't bat an eye. Like, there was no reaction. And I was just like, you know, all these things were processing, processing in your head at the moment. I was just like, well, that was my craft for help. Um, <laughs> that didn't go like I thought. And so I said, right. right. I said, you know what? If I die today, you know, one way or another, the job posting would be up before my obituary. And I said, mm. I'm good. I was like, I'm good. Yeah. You know, some other stuff had happened too. And I was just like, I just made peace with it. It's one of those, um, I, I think I was praying about it. I don't even know if I was in a place to still be able to pray about it. But I felt that um, God would 
provide another way, even if I was, quote, unquote, making a wrong decision, which I don't think I did. I think that, you know, I just had enough belief that he was going to take care of the situation. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of my resignation, no no job lined up. And I was like, <laughs> I'm good. And, and everybody's asking, like, do you want a goodbye lunch or something? You know, when you do, the, like, the little. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> right, that's exactly what I said. I said, nope. <laughs> and everybody's like, oh. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, no. Like, you, no you have a job lined up? Right. It's like, you got a job or something? I was like, mm-mm. And, you know, I had just bought a house. I had been in it for maybe a year or two. They were like, so what are you going to do? I was like, mm-mm. But I was so <laughs> comfortable with leaving. I was like, look. But I won't. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I won't be here. <laughs> right. And I was like, look, what you don't know is I done worked at Walmart before, and I've been cashier of the week. Okay. So I can bag some groceries if need be, and I'm hella good at it. <laughs> So don't play with my gangster. My bills are gonna get paid. Um, oh, but yeah, that was it. That part. Mm-hmm. That was wow. it. Like when yeah, when I got to the point to where I like grateful. No, you said I was what? I gotta drop a I gotta drop a nugget in a second. But go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just saying that that was the the moment where I was just like you know I I felt like nobody legit cared. I was like I can't die and they in my head I was like y'all already took credit for a lot of stuff I've done. You're not gonna take credit for my death either. That's that's what I oh, think wow. kept me here too. Listen, and because I had a letter written, people don't know that I had a letter written, and I was you know oh, the one goodness. of those like this is why I did it, um, and I was naming people, but I was just like I'm still giving you too much credit. We good. So, wow. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Sheesh, y'all. Ooh. Now, I said I was not going to share too much about the book, but I just got to say, Sierra just said she, you know, she she turned in her resignation. Um, but she said in the book that she walks in. <laughs> she walks right in <laughs> to the supervisor's office with the envelope in the hand and just dropped it, like dropped mm-hmm. the mic. Like, mm-hmm. bye, I'm out. Mm-hmm. So straight face. Um, so straight face. And it's it's just admirable because I'd rather you drop a resignation letter with no job than take your life for a job. Like, listen, right? They won't pay me what I need to be paid in the first place. Wow, wow! And to think that this is this narrative is not just the U.S. narrative, and that's that's mm-hmm. something that I really want to highlight is that. Um, this narrative is several several people's narrative, and and there are people who, um, I won't say cannot, but will not take such a brave route of just dipping. And I mean, I can't blame them in in a situation sometimes where there might be a significant other or children or mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. things like that. And it is it's tough because you've gone to school for four, six, eight years. You got the job and the family's back home thinking you rolling in the dough, you doing the thing, you just uh-huh. token, you done made it out, and you're struggling. And so you quitting because, you know, it feels good and you want to be happy, mm, They that ain't what they want to hear. <laughs> exactly. Um, Especially when you got parents like mine who have worked in factories literally their entire adult life. You know what I'm saying? How do I tell? And I, I wrote that. I was like, how do I tell my mom? who does dangerous work. She's not even tall enough to do the work that she does and wow. literally risking her life every day, you know, whether she knows it or not, you know. And and here I am, like, these people were mean to me and I don't want to work there. Like, how do you even come out your mouth right. and say because that? Because that's you know? what it sounds like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what it sounds like when you, when you say it. It's like, oh, I'm whining because I'm not getting my way or because I feel underappreciated um, mm-hmm. when you have, you know, parents work. Wow, I didn't, I, ooh, wow. I, uh-huh. ooh. Slight feels. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. It, it, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm like laughing at words right now, y'all, so excuse me. Um, <laughs> so, and it's I, a, I think it's now a crazy we, privileged feeling, too, like to, like to feel privileged. Like, I mean, I'm a black woman, but I still have degrees that I can walk out of a space and know that I will get another job. My mom and dad can't do that. Can't and that's right. a right. And it's like a, one of those things that I have to constantly check within myself. Like, is it something I need to walk away from or is it just too tough? Or am I just like bougie in a sense? And like, oh, I got these papers. 
So I'm good. Like, who's yeah. going to check me? You know? So, mm. but there. Mm-hmm. Wow. Struggle. Actually, it creates so many levels of, like, struggle and thought processes and mm-hmm. and just things because, I mean, technically you could have walked out and if you weren't so drained from the field, so many people are walking in and out of doors every day. You could have been right back in another university the next right. two weeks, month, you know, at most. And so that's, mm-hmm. wow. Wow, the struggles, educated struggles. Um, Listen, and and it, it. it and it's really interesting though because outside people would think that you know oh you got the keys to the street but uh, not really I might have keys but I don't I don't know what they go to. <laughs> Listen, so, that's a word. <laughs> Hold key ring. Don't know where the keys go. <laughs> Right. So y'all heard us chat a little bit about a book and, and you're saying something about a book. Um, so now we're going to dive into a, a little bit of, of chat about that. So you left, you were working, I'm guessing, and something happened that you, you met somebody and y'all started a book. So, you know what? I'm, I'm messing it up. So just tell us. <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> so yeah, so, um, it was, near the end of my tenure in student affairs and I was talking to Ashley Young Waters, um, who was one of my former students, um, at University of Pittsburgh and we were just having one of those moments of like, um, how do I explain it? Where she would we would just call each other and be like, Girl, let me tell you what happened today. Let me tell you what these fools did <laughs> And so since she was newer to the field, I was hitting her with the you ain't tripping no, nah, you're right. No, nah, they gaslight you. No, nah, that's that's racist. No, nah, that's sexist. You, you know what I'm saying? And just having those moments that I think a lot of us have of, like, just validating one another's feelings, um, helping each other process, and then also helping each other try to navigate, which is a weird feeling because um, just like her and a lot of the students that, um, that I was around at Coastal, I felt like I taught them how to shuck and jive to a certain extent. So, um teaching her how to navigate, but also trying to be careful not to pass on my negative um, behaviors to her. So in one of the conversations, it was just like a, and I'm about to drop the bomb that was what was really said. And um, I think it was in a car and we were talking and it was one of those lines that people tell us all the time, well, if you have a seat at the table, then, you know, basically saying if you have a, this seat, this magical seat, then you'll be a part of the conversation and this stuff will magically change or whatever, as if people can't make changes for folks who aren't at the table because that's weird that you only want to make changes when you see somebody else at the table that looks like the people. That's the only time you're held accountable, but whatever. Um, So it was like talking about this magical seat, and I was just like, man, fuck having a seat. We are at the table. You know what I'm saying? So that kind of just bombed this drop, and that's when it clicked for us. We was just like, yo, we should do something. And bringing all these other stories, you know, it's like it can't just be us. We are not the only people. We knew we weren't the only people. Other colleagues that I had um, at her alma mater were having the same issues. Um, some people I was talking to at Coast were having um, some similar issues. And depending on your identities, how they impacted you differently. So we just decided, um, like a late December, January, of like we're gonna do this, like a, a call, like throw out this fishnet and just see who comes in and put a book together, you know. And we wanted to make something that was from our voices. We didn't want to have a um, – and, and I say this in a loving way. We didn't want to have allies tell our story for us. Because one of the issues with it is this. You have folks who are who are great allies, who do good work for the field. But if you really look at it, they're also – benefiting financially from the struggle you know what I'm saying so it's almost a question of how much change do you really want because that change can potentially impact your your paycheck you know I always point out the Tim Wises and Tim Wise seems like a cool dude never met him before but he'd be dropping some bombs that everybody um, makes reference to of um, like some good knowledge some good gems but he's also getting paid like seriously paid. So we wanted to create a, a platform to where we could um, put the coins back into the pockets of the folks who experienced it, get the real, raw, true, uh, transparent version of the story, and then also um, help other people who are having similar situations feel validated 
in their experience and then also shine a light to folks who are maybe creating these types of experiences for others and saying like, hey, this is something real, this is true, and um, we need to make some, some real changes. So that's where it all came from. And it was just trying to lead a project and we got some dope authors who had some blind faith and stuck with us for 365 days on the dot from start to finish. And that's it. That's It literally happened on a whim. Like I said, I have real wow. fight or flight. Like, you know, so I think that was one of those moments like, we got to go, we got to do something. Like, um, and, and I'm blessed to have, uh, to have known Ashley and to, um, to have had those conversations because even before I talked to her, I was talking to a store a couple of weeks before talking like I just want to do these things you know and she was like everything you need you already have it in people around you you just haven't tapped into it and so mm. when I was talking to Ashley right when I was talking to Ashley it dawned on me you know she has a whole background in communication and marketing and stuff like that so she's good at making websites she's good at making um, promotional materials she's good at all of this like technical stuff that I suck at you know and I think I'm good at organizing folks and organizing people and processes. So when you put us together, I was like, I literally have known you since 2012. And and we just had getting it together. So it's like one of those frustrating pieces. But, like, that's why we have to learn each other's talent so that when you have these moments, you can start tapping into folks. And we can – you're not just – uh, what is it? Um, climbing as you – not – you know when you climb and then is you pull it, people with you. Is it lifting with you? as you climb? Lifting as yeah. you climb? Yeah. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to lift if everybody going with you. You know what I'm saying? You can get more people. Right. So that's why we got to start. Right. You know what I'm saying? We got to start tapping into one another. So blessed to have her. Um, thankful that that this even – I'm thankful for all the authors for even – because, I mean, what? <laughs> can we just be real about it? Like, that's some scary – we all just submit these chapters and just be like, okay, we trust in y'all to do what you're supposed to do. So I mean, I, we're very pleased with the project, very pleased. Wow. I was just going to ask, how does it feel? Like now that it's real, it's out there, um, like literally out there, like y'all got it in my hand right now. I ain't, I'm not going to put a shameless plug that they let me, you know, put a little shoe in on the book, but um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's like literally in my hand. And I, how does it feel to be real? Like, like how does um, that even feel? It's a funny feeling because, uh, like, part of it was, like, I think when it started getting down to the end of the year, last year, we were like, oh, wait, like, this is really, like, we don't want to edit. Oh, we're going to print. Oh, wait, it printed. Oh, wait, it shipped it, you know? Um, I think it was, like, a, a sense of accomplishment. And then it was that moment of, like, oh, shoot, what are people going to say? You know, I think some yeah. of us, mm-hmm, some of us uh, share some things that maybe people don't know about us, you know. Um, and and truth be told, I don't think any author went as deep that she could have went. Um, but it was still scary. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. And um, I was telling somebody else, I, I had a professor at Radford, um, Professor Grimm, and she was one of my favorites. And so she bought the book, and I remember seeing her order come through, and my stomach dropped. You know, this is my professor, who is a white woman, and I'm just like, oh, shit. You know, because I, I, I respect her, and I was just like, how is she going to receive the book? And that's, that's still a weird feeling of, like, these are true moments. This is what's really happening in the field. This isn't made up, but I'm still more worried about what this white woman is going to feel. Yeah. Right, I'm not – right, right. But it was crazy because she hit me up and she was just, like, in love with the book. We had a couple of conversations and talking about we need to meet up and do this, this, and that. And she was talking about all the things that she was trying to do in the field and, and what she needs to do better. And I was like, dang. It was one of those, like, look, if my professor cool with it, then I ain't, I ain't I, can't care about the rest of y'all. Both y'all. y'all. <laughs> right. Both y'all. So, yeah, it's it's cool. Very grateful, very pleased. I'm still some scary moments. But, I mean, it is what it is, you know? It's true. Wow. I mean, it's true. I I, I mean, I have the ultimate respect for each and every author um, because I think mm-hmm. that sharing anything, you know, about yourself is, is just hard, especially as people of color, right? 
It's hard. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when you think about in this world of higher ed and you start thinking about, oh, people start throwing you with, like, how small the field is and um, be careful. And I'm sure, um, especially people who may still be in student affairs or higher ed or or something like that, that they probably got some clap back when they said they were participating in this because um, for those listeners who don't really, you know, know a lot about that field working in it, I know most of my listeners – um, did go to college, but uh, you may not know on that side of working in it, um, people will advise you, you know, to be careful and everybody knows mm-hmm. everybody. So don't, you know, you're always supposed to pretend like everything is perfect and, and you know, not really complain about things and share your, your, um, experiences because they are ultimately worried about that seat at the table, not thinking about being mm-hmm. careful. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that they get so stuck in the like rat will race of, you know, I got to get the VP or I got to get to this point, so then at least I can make half a coin, right? Um, Uh (laughs) But you still are, you know, working tirelessly and selling your voice in some spaces. Uh Um, And and this is especially at our predominantly white institutions. And so I I just have the ultimate respect for everyone who participated, but, like, to you and Ashley, like, shout out to (laughs) y'all. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Dealing with... (laughs) dealing with people um, and differences and, and working through this, because have either of you, like, ever put together, like, a project like this? Not at all, and especially not with people that we, it's 11 of us, and, you know, and I can count on one hand how many of y'all have met face-to-face. Um, wow. And that's the worst. Right. Yeah, what's the thing about it? You, Ashley, Jillian? Wait, let me go through. But that might be... <laughs> Look, I got the book wow. here. I'm looking at the names. Yeah. That's literally all the people that I met face to face. So, um, yeah. What was the question again? I got stuck on that. <laughs> <laughs> like, how, like, how have you two ever kind of worked on anything like this? Like, how oh. did y'all, like, even, like, make it through that process? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. wow. So I was a With part strangers, of. Now that you. Now that you've given right. us um, insight, now you now you're letting us know that this was with complete strangers. You might as well say right. <laughs> and I used to laugh because I was just like, cause yeah. I remember one of the authors requested like a video conference one time. I was just like, mm, she probably want to know if we real people, but uh, but it's very <laughs> true. You know, you writing a story and handing it over to these strangers and letting them edit. That's weird. Um, but I participated in a book that was collaborative like this before um, called the My Now Books, and it's kind of like a series, which is similar to what we want to turn the table into. It's a series of books, and uh, okay. it was the same concept. One of the major differences was that um, to participate, I think you had to pay 100 or $150 to, to come in, and that would guarantee you uh, 20 books or 15, something like that, um, which, I mean, makes sense, but that's one major difference that we wanted. Um, with this project was that we didn't want people to have to pay coming in because once again, there's a lot of opportunities for professional development in the field, but you have to have money for it. And, you know, say you're mm-hmm. somebody that's a grad mm-hmm. student, you know, right. You might not have that, that money right off. Um, you might not have the money at the moment. We had an author who, um, congratulations. She just had a baby the other day. Um, oh, wow. I'm not going to act a, yeah, huh? Um, Tierra, Tierra, and once again, I've yeah, never heard her yeah. name said out loud, right? She just right, had we know, we so <laughs> we never met her, but she had a baby. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, how am I going to ask this lady who was pregnant for all of 2018 send me this money real quick so you can be a part of this? So, um, so I've been a part of the process, but never been on the backside of it, and um, it was a good learning experience, and it was. It was so much stuff that happened on the back end that the authors never knew anything about it, which was funny. Um, just little stuff like, okay, the book is coming out, and then it was like, oh, wait, taxes. Just stuff like that. that like, we're thinking about some taxes. You know, and how right. is it going to impact people? Right. We're creating another source of income for folks that we might turn around and put you in a bad situation at the end of the year, and you got to owe money. Not even thinking, yeah. you know. So, um, and I think you might have mentioned that tab you and uh jill so there was another layer of like oh, okay yeah we're gonna fix that and then i was like actually shoot taxes like <laughs> but um yeah, yeah. i mean and, and that's so that's admirable also because like that means that you all didn't mind shifting you and i and i can say as an author that you all were transparent you didn't mind saying you know what i don't know we ain't think about that let me get the answer 
Um, mm-hmm. We'll be right back with you. You know, you were very transparent throughout the conversation. I mean, the the project throughout, you know, so much grace was shown, understanding that, you know, uh, people were, you know, living their lives and, and working and, mm-hmm. and making things happen and having babies and, you know, all these things are going <laughs> on. So, so um, you know, certain certain things don't happen, like, as we would like for them to happen in our perfect world, but you guys were just so, so, so awesome. So I, I'm glad that I was able to be a part of the project. And so let us know kind of how, how did you find these ladies since you don't know any of them? How did y'all, how was the selection process? How did that, that go? Sure. So, um, like I said, we kind of did a, a casting call, if you will, and we posted it into some major Facebook groups on, okay. <laughs> some major Facebook groups on Facebook, um, on Facebook. that were, <laughs> that were tailored to student affairs. And then, um, you know, we did some conference calls, like informational sessions, and then people would send in their um, application, if you will. And it would just be a bio about themselves, an abstract about what they would like to talk about, um, and things like that. We didn't really ask where – well, we did ask where people work, but it wasn't something that they had to tell. Um, just because, once again, like you said, that information is uh, is sensitive, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, it – and we didn't want to blackball anybody or make anybody feel like they were being called out for even trying to participate um, in one way or another. So when we got all of the applications in, we read over them and was just like, okay, well, who's going to be who's, – whose story – and this is the challenging part because you're trying to pick what stories you want to put into a book, but not – like how do I say it? Everybody's story is valid. You know what I'm saying? So you're literally trying to pick people to go into this book to kind of fit what you want it to be, but then also realizing that, like, this might not be what you originally thought because there's so many experiences within the field. And I think that's um, – you can see that in, like, Ainsley's chapter. It's STEM-related, you know? Yeah. Um, right. And I would never – right. no idea about. <laughs> right. And that was, a, that was a thing. I was just like, ah. So when we saw that pop up, we was like, how can we tell this person that her story isn't valid that we can't? Because it is. It's just something that we never thought about. So um, right. looking at everybody's piece and just making sure, like, okay, you have a story to tell. Um, we're going to offer you this opportunity to be a part of the project. And truth be told, you know, we had some people that, that you know, in the early stages kind of backed out. Um, but the 11 mm-hmm. authors that finished were the ones that, you know, hit that first conference call, were there from the time we, you know, put, put the pavement and, we have a hundred percent retention rate. I like to say. Uh, so yeah, the the process itself, I think, and and I don't even want to say like people just couldn't see the vision, and I don't want to make it sound like that. But I mean, it is daunting to think about this is a commitment that you might have for a couple of months. And at the time, you know, the timeline was a lot shorter because it was like, okay, we're gonna knock this out quick, um, and it didn't quite happen mm-hmm. like that. But that's that's a hard yeah. commitment, and especially to something that's new, and especially to something that you have to be vulnerable and transparent, and all of these, you know, time commitment, all of these things. So I think the, right. the process all the itself, <laughs> right, the process in itself kind of um, weeded out some folks. Um, but what we ended up with is is we couldn't be happier. That is so wow. That is so amazing. Thank <laughs> you for for sharing that aspect so let let some listeners know as we conclude let them know how can they connect with Sierra how can they find the table books how can they find out more information I heard you mention there's a series so that means there's more to come so so just share all the deets on how we can how we can be connected to you sure sure so of course on the website for um, the book in general where you can read the bios of each author as well as get information on how to purchase um all of the proceeds when you purchase from an author all of the profits go to that particular author um so and there's a section that that kind of describes it on the website as well and that is www.thetablebooks.com um to where you can get that for me personally sierra the table book at gmail.com um it's where you can connect with me also on facebook if you like which Facebook is kind of weird because sometimes I'll be missing messages. So, I mean, you can find me if you want to, but charge it to my head, not to my heart, if I don't know how to work Messenger. <laughs> um, but Sierra L. Harrison. And then um, 
my Instagram page, see it twice, and it's S I E underscore it underscore twice. Um, but yeah, we are hoping to make the table um, a longer spread, if you will, and you mm. know, invite some other folks to share their stories as well, and um, kind of pulling in some identities that might not be ours, you know. And always making sure that we have somebody at the table that's leading a conversation that shares those identities. You know, we wanted to bring in black men in student affairs. And so neither me or Ashley identified with being male. So we want to bring in um, a man to be able to, to kind of lead those conversations and be the point of contact for folks who are interested in that. And then we just kind of run the, the background noise, if that makes sense. Awesome. Um, we also were looking into... Um, just different things at the table, whether it's uh, um, planners, um, um, supplies and stuff, you know, just anything that kind of goes along with just expanding the brand. Um, but that's that's okay. becoming the future right now. We do want to just keep the book thing going and uh, just keep creating a platform for folks to get their, their work out and the stories out and putting coins back into the pocket. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing. And I have to go backwards to say, like, Sierra wasn't even selfish, just not a, like, that's a true leader um, of a project. She could have just shouted out, you know, her page on the table book, but she talked about how you can go on the website, check out all the authors. Um, if you know none of them, you can check them all out to who you want to support, and 100% mm-hmm. of the proceeds go to that author. Um, so that's that's commendable also so we have that to you uh thank you so much for spending almost an hour with us on the show i am excited y'all connect with the air check out the table book even if you're not um even even if you're not in the field it, it's a good read to give you insight on, absolutely um people <laughs> you know people and things that happen to us you know educated folks because at the end of the day you know i can have 50 degrees i'm still a black woman so Mm-hmm. And degrees are not bulletproof. Mm. Mm. Ooh. Mm. You That's know what? Dillas no, Black. We, we, yeah, we done. I got we done. Plug. Black. That's where I got that from. I got that from Jillian Black. So <laughs> on Instagram. Jillian Black. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm at the tag. I'm at the tag that in the show notes. All right. Thank you, Sierra. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Listen, yeah, degrees please. aren't bulletproof. It's not where you start. It's about the journey self-awareness matters it's okay to not be okay and leave places that you do not feel comfortable those are just a few takeaways that i have from this interview but so many great nuggets i cannot thank sierra enough for spending time with us sharing transparently going deep um and just being honest there's so much filtered stuff out there so i am grateful to have people in your earbuds that are not afraid to tell the good the bad and the ugly so shout out to sierra all her information to connect or enough information to find her at least is in the show notes be sure to check out the table books and all the authors that are featured in there including myself um great stories amazing platforms and some awesome women of color who refuse to let their voices be silent so until next time be great believe in great and do great things have a good one